thought. All right, so it is 11.03, we're gonna start. Um, I think I'm hoping to many of you that I am a familiar face. So I'm Nanette Macy-Junes. Uh, I see some of your names and faces, so I know you all. So um, this is our first armchair uh, trip. Uh, we decided to invite our adjunct curator for European art, Anne Dumas to do this with us from London. So Anne is, uh, what time is it? Anne, it's like five o'clock Anne's time or something. Five past four. Day. <laughs> for Anne, uh, in the morning for all of us. Uh, Anne can drink wine, the rest of us need to be drinking coffee or tea. Uh, so we're gonna get started. Anne has been connected to the Columbus Museum of Art for a very, very long time. Uh, she started as a sort of guest curator for different projects. And the very first year that I was director, which was 2003, Anne had been scheduled to come and talk to us about future projects and that's when we met. And we decided that she should join our team and keep working with us. So we've done many, many things with Anne. Uh, Anne has been a long time curator at the Royal Academy in London. And she has also recently joined the Houston team uh, as their consultant curator. So she has a role at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, very similar. Sure. To so now a few um, uh, housekeeping. We are gonna have time for questions and answers at the end. So you can type those into the chat. Since there's so many of us, we are not going to unmute and talk because when there's 150 people, that's a really challenging. Um, you should all be muted um, by us, because when you have a large group, we mute you. Um, if for some reason you're not looking like you're muted, please mute yourself. Um, you can leave your video on or not. Now, the way the screen is set up differ from family to family and um, machine to machine. So you might want to just, you're welcome to turn your, vid your own video off if you, if you don't want us watching, but we will all screen share and be watching Anne and we'll see Anne in the upper hand first. We will of course post the video. For some of you, you might have a hard time seeing the names, not the images of the paintings and works of art, but the names on the right hand side. We'll see um, if that how that turns out in the video. If we still need to send uh, post the slide so that you can write those down, we will do that too. So without further ado, Anne, it's your time. I'm gonna turn my video off and enjoy you. Okay, um, can I have the first slide, please? Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody from London. Um, I'm sorry that COVID has put a temporary stop to our wonderful trips, but I'm very happy to talk to you this afternoon about a few of my favorite paintings in the National Gallery. Um, I grew up in London and I visited this great museum nearly all my life as an enthusiastic teenager and then as an art history student. And I continue to go still frequently now. Uh, just before um, moving on to the paintings, I'd just like to tell you uh, briefly about the history of the National Gallery. Um, it was originally founded in 1824. Um, when the uh, British government was persuaded to put up the money to buy 38 paintings from a distinguished private collection of old master paintings um, put together by a man called John Angerstein. Um, the, so the museum was first housed in what had been his private residence in a, a townhouse in Pall Mall in the centre of London, but it was very popular with the public and soon it was found it was getting, when people visited, it was too hot and too crowded. So it was decided to build a, a museum, an actual museum to house the, the growing collection. Um, and that the building started in 1832, was finished in 1838. We see a photo of the facade here um, by the architect William Wilkinson in a, a sort of neoclassical style, you know, based on the idea of a Greek temple with uh, steps going up the front, a grand portico, a dome and columns, really very much a prototype for uh, grand museum building throughout the 19th 
and early, very early part of the 20th century of many examples in America, as you will know. The idea is that you're sort of creating a temple of culture. It was decided to build the new museum in Trafalgar Square. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in the heart of London. And the reason for this was that it was seen as kind of at the center of the different kinds of population in London. To the west of Trafalgar Square was where all the wealthy people were and to the east was the poor people, put simply. But from the beginning, the museum was conceived as a museum for everybody and that admission should always be free. And that has remained true to this day. You do not have to, to pay. You have to pay for temporary exhibitions, but not to visit the permanent collection. There you see uh, Nelson's column in the, the photograph on the right, one of the other main distinguishing feature of Trafalgar Square. Well, um, without further ado, let's look at first at my first painting. Next slide, please. Oh, no, sorry, just before we leave that, this is one of the grand galleries um, in the National Gallery. You can see it's a purpose built, very grand, high ceiling room with natural top light. This is where they house their big collection of um, uh, paintings of the Italian, mostly the Italian high Renaissance artists like um, Raphael, Titian, Tintoretto, um, Veronese, etc. And in, in fact, um, the Italian collection is one of the great strengths of the Nat National Gallery. So let's look now at a painting by an, an Italian artist of the early Renaissance, Paolo Uccello, one of the most famous paintings in the National Gallery. It's called The Battle of San Romano, and it was painted between 1438 and 1440. As you can see, it's a vigorous battle scene uh, with opposing cavalry charging each other, fighting going on in the hills in the background. Um, it was a battle of the Florentines against the people from the, uh, the town of Pisa because the Florentines wanted to win uh, strategic control over the port of Pisa, which was one of which the main trade routes for um, from Tuscany to the rest of the world. Now, for any of you familiar with traveling in Italy today, it seems inconceivable that towns like Florence and Pisa that are only about 30 miles apart should be at war. But we have to remember that at this time, Italy was divided up really into a whole series of little kingdoms known as the, the city states. Um, Paolo Hucello has got a lot of a sense of the sort of energy and vigor of the battle, but it's a kind of idealized fantasy vision of a battle. Um, there's no blood. Uh, there's one dead soldier lying in the foreground, but there's no real sense of, of violence or, or suffering. Um, and so he's made this sort of fantasy. And if you look closely, you can't really see from the slide, but if you have a chance to visit the gallery at some time, you'll see that he's used actual gold leaf paint, uh, which he's sort of burnished to shine. He's used a lot of decorative techniques like punching holes into the horse's bridles, for example. And originally this painting would have looked very different. It would have been much brighter because all of the armor was painted in silver paint but silver tarnishes and darkens with age and so now all of the armor which makes up quite a large part of this composition is just a gray but we have to imagine what it would look like all sort of sparkling with silver and the reds too in the amazingly flamboyant hat uh, worn by the uh, military commander who I don't think would have been wearing such a hat in in the midst of battle all of these colors would have been uh, much stronger. Um, this is one of three canvases about, of this subject, the Battle of San Romano that Paolo Uccello uh, painted. It's a very large canvas. Um, the other two, one is in the um, Louvre and the other is in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. It's not quite, I don't quite remember when they were separated, but several centuries ago. But even, um, during the artist's lifetime, Ludovic um, Medici, 
who was the sort of great prince that, who ruled Florence under the Medici dynasty in the early 15th century. He liked this painting so much that he hijacked it. He just sort of stole it really from the well-to-do Florentine family who had commissioned the painting from Uccello to hang in his own palace. Uh, it came to the National Gallery um, early in the 19th century. Uh, one of the first uh, directors of the National Gallery was a man called Sir Charles Eastlick, who was um, very keen on early Italian painting, and this was one of his acquisitions. However, um, in some ways, the style of the painting looks back to the past to a style called international Gothic, which had flourished in the late Middle Ages, end of the 14th century, beginning of the 15th century, which really um, favors this very decorative uh, use of color and gold and silver, rich materials, very decorative. But at the same time, this painting really is very modern because what Paolo Uccello is doing here, he's really mastering this one of these brilliant new inventions that occurred in Italy at the time of the Renaissance, which was how to render perspective. Now, I'm sure as many of you know, if you've been through many uh, galleries of uh, earlier European painting, that you often see paintings that just have a flat gold background. The artists really don't even attempt or don't have the skill or the knowledge to render space in depth. But it was one of the great mathematical discoveries, scientific and mathematical discoveries of the uh, Renaissance. And here we see Uccello, one of the first artists really trying to master this in the two dimensional medium of a painting. And he's, I think, gone slightly over the top with it. He's very sort of proud that he can do it. So we've got all of these lances pointing off into the distance and the lances on the ground, you know, they're all kind of pointing to a central vanishing point. And perhaps the really um, key point, if you noticed in, in the lower left corner of the painting, we've got this body of a dead soldier lying flat on the ground on his stomach. And his, that really is an exercise in foreshortening. We can see that his body, you know, is moving, well, not moving, but it moving backwards into space, into the distance. So this is a very important painting. It's always taught in, you know, 101 History of Art courses about one of the first uh, early Renaissance paintings when you really see an artist grappling with this new understanding of space and depth. Um, let's look at the next picture. Uh, this is a, a painting of the uh, Northern Renaissance by one of the great artists of this period, Jan van Eyck, uh, the Arnolfini portrait. Um, painted pretty much around the same time as the route of San, the Battle of San Romano, uh, which we've just been looking at. Again, one of the most famous paintings in the National Gallery, and in a way, rather a mysterious and enigmatic painting. Uh, many scholars have studied this, a great deal has been written about it over the centuries. Nobody has really worked out quite uh, what is going on. Uh, we enter um, a, a rather lavishly furnished and decorated room um, in Bruges in Belgium in the early 15th century. And we, we are greeted by a couple, a man and a woman holding hands, uh, clearly a, a married couple. And for a long time, it was thought that this painting actually was a sort of marriage contract, that it celebrated the marriage uh, between um, a man who has been identified as most likely somebody called Giovanni di Niccolo di Alfino, um, who, Arnolfini, um, who was uh, a well-to-do Italian merchant uh, living and working in Bruges uh, in Belgium. Uh, but then there was always the sort of question that people thought that his wife looked pregnant, but that um, idea has now been largely dismissed because uh, through the work of a lot of uh, fashion historians, uh, they've discovered that at this time in Belgium and in Northern Europe, in the early 15th century, it was traditional or it was typical for women to wear these dresses, these gowns, 
uh, with a great deal of sort of material that fell to the ground in heavy folds. And it was characteristic that they would kind of bunch up the, the front of the dress, the skirt, and hold it up, which is what she's doing here. Um, so uh, if we look, cast our eye around the room, it's really as if Van Eyck has just kind of taken off the front wall of the room and invited us to step in. Uh, I think one thing that perhaps strikes immediately is the round mirror at, at, at the center of the composition on the back wall. It's a convex mirror. I don't know how much you can see on the screen, but certainly when one's looking at the painting, first of all, you get a slightly distorted view of the room itself. But then you see two men entering the room from our side of the, uh, as it were, from behind us. Um, and with one of them with his right hand raised. Possibly he is the artist, uh, Jan van Eyck. It has been suggested that van Eyck was a friend of the Arnolfini, the couple that we're looking at. And above the mirror, written in very sort of flourish, a flourish of handwriting in Latin, are the words Johannes van Eyck Fuit Hick, 1434, meaning Jan van Eyck was here. In, in 1434. So in effect, he's signing and dating the picture in a rather original way. If we cast our eye around the room, you'll notice on the right, a large uh, four poster bed that takes up you know, a good se sized section of the room covered in a red woolen fabric. Um, this actually was not a bedroom, and apparently at this time in, in uh, Belgium, at least, I didn't know about other places, it was not so unusual to have a bed in the reception room. And you'll see more of this red woolen fabric on the bench in the background. Now, um, wool, and, and especially dyed wool, beautifully colored dyed wool like this, was very a very expensive commodity in the Middle Ages. So in a way, this is a status portrait. Everything in it tells us something about um, the wealth and the taste, the social status and the prosperity of this uh, merchant's family. Um, so you see he is wearing a, a sort of a tunic, a tabard, in, probably in silk velvet uh, with fur around the bottom. And he's wearing a large black hat, which has been identified as sort of finely plaited straw. Uh, there's a brass chandelier above them. There's a, 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 a sort of necklace of beads or bead, threaded beads hanging to the left of the mirror. We can also see um, some rather elaborately carved furniture. There's a view, light is coming in from the window to the left. Um, the man has, you see those sort of wooden uh, shoes that they, they were sort of uh, a kind of overshoes worn um, to, uh, well, he's wearing his overshoes, I think, the heavier ones. And then those were the shoes that he would have worn possibly in that side of the house. And even a little detail, like just behind the man to the left, we see some oranges on a wooden chest. Oranges at the time were also extremely expensive. They did not grow in Northern Europe, had to be imported from more exotic places. Now, just as I mentioned that uh, Paolo Uccello made a great leap forward as one of the artists to first to grapple with the new understanding of perspective. Equally, uh, Jan van Eyck is generally credited to be the first Western artist to work in oil paint. Uh, before this, artists had worked more in tempera, where pigments were bound with usually egg, egg yolk or sometimes water as the binding element. Now they started mixing pigment with oil. And this gave tremendous um, expressive and technical freedom to the artist. Next slide, please. Um, so I just wanted to show you a, a detail here. You just see how incredibly finely painted the fur is around the bottom of Arnolfini's uh, tunic. And then look at this incredibly detailed sort of stitching and gathering decoration in his wife's sleeves and the folds of the green fabric as it falls and the white fur trim. And the lovely painting, almost 
each individual hair by hair of the little their little terrier dog a dog of course in paintings at this time often present as a an emblem of fidelity uh, next slide please And so here we are back as, as composition as a whole. And so we will ne really never know quite the reason for it. Maybe nothing further than just they were proud of their status, proud of their clothes, their fashionable, stylish, but not flashy dress and their beautiful room. But I think the fact that there is a slight mystery that always hangs over this painting adds to its continuing appeal. Uh, next slide, please. Right, uh, let's go on now to two uh, self-portraits by the greatest Dutch artist of the 17th century, uh, Rembrandt. Um, Rembrandt painted an enormous number of self-portraits, I think about 80 altogether. I don't think it was just that he was vain, but he it meant that he was a sitter for himself who was always available. And he was very interested in capturing different effects of how you paint the skin and flesh and, and clothing as, as much as being, I think, obsessed with his own image. Uh, the one on the left shows him as a confident young man at the age of 34. He leans on a parapet, sort of almost entering our space and gazes very directly at us. But what's fascinating about this portrait, um, it was painted in 1640, but Rembrandt has dressed himself up in the clothes of an earlier era, even about a hundred years before. He's very uh, lavishly dressed in a sort of jacket or coat of silk and velvet with a rich fur trim. We can see a sort of pleated silk vest underneath. He's got a large fur hat in which there are jewels. Um, and this was fashionable dress for a man in the mid 16th century, not the mid 17th century when Rembrandt is painting. Um, so why does he do this? Well, first of all, Rembrandt did love dressing up. I would love to have seen his dressing up box. He often dresses his people in his portraits in you know, exotic clothes of another place, another you know, part of the more exotic part of the world or a, a more um, a historic time. Um, here, I think he's presenting himself not as only as an artist, but as, a, as a, in the clothes of a nobleman. And it's partly that he, he was born in Leiden, but by this time he's moved to Amsterdam and he's really trying to make his way as an artist. And so he thinks if he presents himself in this wealthy way, uh, and as someone who's actually of a higher social class than he actually came from, it will help him attract clients and customers of that class. And also he's paying homage to the great artists of the earlier century, um, to such artists as Titian, for example, or um, uh, Dürer or Raphael, and the kind of educated clientele that he was trying to attract would have been aware of that kind of reference. And then rather movingly, we move to the portrait on the right, uh, painted uh, in, in the very last uh, year of Rembrandt's life, just a few months before he dies, uh, when he is uh, age 63. Uh, a very different uh, image of himself. He looks uh, rather weary and, and rather resigned perhaps. Um, and he's not so confident, he's, he's quieter, more introspective. Um, it's nevertheless beautifully painted. He's more, more humbly dressed, although there is rather beautiful decoration around his collar and he's wearing a sort of gold cap. But you're, again, hard to see in a slide, but in front of the actual painting, there's an interesting contrast between the background, which is very finely painted, and real kind of clumps of paint on the face, capturing that sort of blotchiness, um, on his forehead and the sagging fold under his uh, right eye is just done with a single swirl of a very um, heavy paint, a brush heavily laden with paint. Um, very often writers, you know, particularly in our own time and in the 20th century, 
have interpreted these late portraits of Renoir, uh, oh, sorry, of Rembrandt, um, as kind of self-searching, you know, existential sort of angst. But I think we have to be wary of putting that kind of, you know, in a kind of late 20th century, um, 21st century way of thinking onto something that was painted, you know, 300 years or so before. Um, and it may well be that it, it this is just a fairly straightforward, you know, he's just really interested in capturing the, the tones, the textures and the colors of his flesh and his clothes. But nevertheless, whatever the, the real, his real meaning, which we'll never really know, these are two splendid portraits and it's wonderful to have the two from the, his early career and then what, and then really his, virtually his very last portrait um, together in the same room. Next slide, please. Um, now here we have a, a painting by uh, George Stubbs, uh, who really, <clears throat> great painter in the 18th century in England, English painter born in Liverpool in the north of England, who really made his name as a painter of horses. And this is an outstanding example. I think it's really, the greatest painting of a horse I've ever seen. Um, you can immediately see from its size, it's 115 inches tall and 97 inches wide. It's on a monumental scale. And this was something really audacious at the time. Normally, paintings of this size would be reserved for the portrait of a king or a queen or some famous military leader, not an animal. Although um, horses were very highly revered by the, the, the English aristocracy, this horse was called Whistlejacket, and he's a superb thoroughbred Arabian chestnut horse who belonged to the Marquis of Rockingham. Uh, Whistlejacket had won a very famous race at York in the north of England uh, in 1759. But by the time that this portrait of him was painted, about 1762, he had uh, retired from, from racehorsing. Um, it's a really superb example of the animal. And um, Stubbs had a profound knowledge of the anatomy of the horse. And he, in fact, published a book called The Anatomy of the Horse, which has wonderfully detailed drawings of the anatomy. And he, he spent a lot of time actually dissecting uh, dead horses so that he understood in great depth the structure of their bones and their muscles and how their bodies worked. Um, it has been suggested that this is an unfinished portrait because one thing that is so unusual about it is the completely blank background. It's just a sort of flat, neutral, rather beautiful pale gold color that beautifully sets off the chestnut color of Whistlejacket's coat. But it was a very unusual thing to do at the time. It was not unusual to paint racehorses, but usually you would paint them in a landscape accompanied by their owner or uh, performing, you know, actually running in a race. So this completely blank background is very um, startling in a way. And so some people have suggested that the painting was unfinished and that Stubbs would have intended to add a landscape background. I rather think that, like to think that he wouldn't, that it is finished because there's nothing sketchy about it. It looks an immaculately finished work in terms of technique. And I think he understood, you know, it's a sort of gesture of breathtaking originality just to let the horse be alone against this black bank black background. Um, the, he's chosen to paint the horse not still, but sort of rearing up, full of a kind of wild energy, with quite a wild look in the eye. The mane is flowing. So we get a sense of the sheer force of this tremendous beast. And just look how he captures the shine of the light over the horse's beautiful smooth coat, which contrasts with the much sort of fe more feathery and light painting of his very uh, beautifully groomed tail and mane. Um, next slide, please. So we stay here in the uh, 18th century England, um, 
one of the much loved paintings um, in the National Gallery and certainly one of my favorites. It's uh, by the great English 18th century artist, Thomas Gainsborough, and it is called Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. Uh, we're looking at a stylish young uh, English couple of the uh, country landed gentry. Uh, Robert Andrews was about 25 when this was painted and his wife, Frances, was about 17. Um, he, he, they're stylishly dressed, but in sort of stylish country clothes. He's wearing a shooting jacket. He's holding his shotgun. He's got his faithful hunting dog uh, looking up at him. We see bags or a bag hanging from his belt where he would have had the powder for the gun and the shots. Uh, she is dressed in a silk skirt and jacket of the palest blue. She's wearing a straw hat and she's wearing, uh, you, if you look closely, sort of blackless uh, shoes that are probably shoes to be worn you know, in the house. So they're not kind of dressed up to go to London or out to a ball, um, but they don't look like peasants working on the land. You know, this is a well-to-do couple. But in it, it has often been said that this is a portrait, there are three um, elements in this portrait, Mr. Andrews, Mrs. Andrews, and the landscape. Uh, because the landscape is really almost the dominant uh, aspect of this beautiful painting. Uh, the Andrews are po posed under an oak tree on an ornate uh, outdoor garden bench, but rolling away from them is the countryside of Suffolk that Gainsborough came from in the east of England. Um, from the cornfield to the right, it's probably high summer, July or August, and he's perfectly got that sort of changing effect of, of weather that, you know, England's an island, so the weather, the light changes all the time. As you know, it rains very frequently. Here we've got dark clouds coming up over to the left, probably going to be a, a summer shower before long. But that beautiful effect of, of the sunlight coming through a slightly overcast sky. Um, some people have tried to read various things into Mrs. Andrews' expression. She looks a little bit stiff, a little bit prim, um, not at quite as a relaxed a pose as her husband, but it's very uh, difficult really to, to read anything specific into that. Um, the couple um, had nine children eventually, but Mrs. Andrews died quite young. She died at the age of 48, whereas Mr. Andrews married again and lived on to the age of 80. Um, they both came from prosperous landowning countries and uh, families and in, through their marriage, they became owners of very extensive land for about 3000 acres. And here, rather like the Arnolfinis that we were looking at a moment ago, this is in a way a status portrait, but instead of being shown in their room in their house, they've chosen probably as a result of conversations, I imagine some kind of collaboration between them and Gainsborough to be painted outside um, in the landscape and, and the, the estates which they own, of which they were obviously very proud. Next slide, please. Uh, another quintessentially English painter, John Constable, now we're in the early 19th century. Uh, this is one of his most famous paintings, the Haywain, painted in uh, 1821. Uh, he came from the same part of England as Gainsborough, Suffolk, in the eastern part, southeastern part of England, or to the north of London and to the east. Um, Again, he loved the countryside and he loved uh, capturing weather and the effects of weather. Um, I should have mentioned that Gainsborough actually didn't like painting portraits very much and some of his letters complain about how fed up he was with portraits and how much he much preferred nature. So I'm sure that came into the arrangement he struck with the Andrews. Um, this is not a commissioned portrait as, as, the, as the Mr. and Mrs. Andrews would have been. Uh, Constable here is just capturing a typical rural scene in his native Suffolk. 
the hay wain. The wain refers to the wooden cart that we can see crossing the shallow waters of the River Stour. And it would go to pick up hay or the, the, the harvested grass, uh, corn, wheat in the, on the fields beyond the river and bring it back um, to be processed. Um, the little cottage you see to the left was lived in by a man called Willie Lott. And apparently uh, Willie Lott never once in his life left the village of East Burgold where this painting is, um, is the scene of this painting, and he lived to almost 100. So I think in a way this painting is a, very much about the continuity, the peaceful, rural, regular rhythms of rustic and agricultural life in England in the 18th century. And I think it's worth remembering, of course, that this is the time when, in fact, in England, the, rust, the Industrial Revolution was really getting going. It sort of began at the end of the 18th century, but by now, by the 1820s, early 19th century, up in the north of England, you've got the great manufacturing industries beginning to really develop, like railways, shipping, uh, textiles, and etc. It did not affect this part of England that we're looking here, because this is very much agricultural still at this time. But nevertheless, I think the, the growing um, mechanization, the growing sort of technical power of the Industrial Revolution was engendering a certain kind of nostalgia about the old way of life, these, tr these country traditions, these unchanging, peaceful rhythms of life, which I think is very much uh, what the, this kind of painting by Constable is about. Um, it's quite a large painting. It's nearly about six foot wide. And he does do a whole series of these paintings of rural England that are six foot wide that have become known as his six footers. Um, Constable is very popular in England now, but he was less so in his own time. However, he was quite a radical painter. Uh, can we see it? have the next slide, please? Um, you see in a clip, yes, next one, yeah, a close up here. He, he painted in quite a sort of rough te technique, which I think you can see in the sort of pebbly sandy texture of the shore along the edge of the river and the way he beautifully captures the shimmer of sunlight on the surface of the water. Um, and this was to have to become very influential in the later 19th century, as we'll see later on. Um, it, it, he did become, have quite a strong influence, for example, on the French Impressionists who developed a style of capturing texture and, and light with kind of loose brushwork uh, later in the 19th century. Next slide, please. So we just say goodbye to this sort of wonderful, peaceful vision. It's very relaxing. I was fine to kind of sit in front of this painting and spend a few minutes with it and watch these clouds uh, drifting across the sky. Next slide. Now here we have the other great uh, English painter of the uh, 19th century, the early 19th century, J.M.W. Turner, great romantic painter. Um, born in London, right in the heart of London, in Covent Garden, but travelled widely throughout his life. Uh, he particularly uh, travelled to capture places that offered dramatic scenery, such as the Swiss Alps. Here, though, he's very much in England, um, only about uh, 12 miles or so from London, um, at a town called Maidenhead on the River Thames, and we're watching a train hurtling towards us across the Maidenhead Bridge, which crosses the Thames at this point. And the train ran from uh, London to Oxford. Um, this painted in 18, 18, 1844, which is really a kind of high point of Victorian painting. And as I'm sure you're aware, you know, Victorian painting is always often very precise, usually tells a particular story, has quite a strong narrative. But Turner leaps way beyond that here into something so modern for his time, it's almost unbelievable, because he's, what he's really interested in painting is what the title of the paint, 
Jing tells us, rain, steam, and speed. So he's capturing rain, but kind of sunlight and mist coming through the wet rain and this sort of almost kind of hurricane of brush strokes. He's using, I think, very diluted oil paint here. And of course, we remember that Turner is one of the great watercolorists of all time. Here at the medium is oil on canvas, but he's bringing to painting in oil that wonderful fluidity and luminosity and transparency that he really achieved through working so frequently in watercolor. There's a viaduct to the left of the composition that's almost just sort of being absorbed into the light of, uh, and the rain and everything that's this incredible sense of atmosphere. And he is, of course, embracing modernity. I just mentioned the Industrial Revolution. And here we have this train, great symbol of, of the Industrial Revolution in a way, just rushing towards us, this whole idea of, tremendous idea of modern mechanical speed. Uh, very interestingly, um, there was an engraving made, a print made after this, a few years after Turner painted this work, in around 1850, I think. Uh, which shows a uh, running along the, uh, the train tracks just to the side, a hare running. Um, and I think he's trying to sort of compare the speed of nature with a speed, with mechanized speed. But the, um, the painting has faded and has become uh, completely transparent at that point. So the hare is no longer in the painting, but we know that it was there from this um, engraving. Next slide, please. Now for something very different. Uh, we're still in the mid 19th century, but now we go to France, to Paris, at the height of the very uh, opulent and fashionable Second Empire, uh, when Napoleon III uh, had uh, done a coup d'etat and established the Second Empire uh, with its seat in Paris. Uh, we're looking at a portrait of a very uh, grand young lady of the Second Empire. Her name, I have to read it out, I couldn't possibly remember it. It's Madame Marie Clotilde Ignace de Foucault uh, Moitessier. Madame Moitessier, we call her for short. Um, and this was a statement of high fashion. The, the Empress, uh, Napoleon III's wife, the Spanish Empress Eugenie, was a woman of great fashion who really set the tone for how the women of the Second Empire dressed. Um, you can see she's wearing a beautiful floral gown. Uh, she has magnificent jewelry. And this was painted by the great French 19th century portraitist Jean Dominique Ingres. Uh, an artist known for his roots in the classical tradition. He was a great admirer of Raphael for the sort of perfection of his technique, but also for his sort of originality. Um, he was commissioned to make this portrait. He had earlier spent time in Rome where he really uh, earned a living um, making a lot of uh, pencil portraits, actually, of the French and British aristocracy living in Rome at the time. He's now back in Paris, and he's fed up with doing portraits, and he really did not want to take on another portrait. But he uh, asked a very high price for this portrait, which uh, Monsieur Moitessier, the uh, young woman's husband, agreed to pay, so Ang decided to do the portrait. However, um, often people ask me, you know, how long does it take for an artist to do, a, to, to, do, to do a painting? Well, of course, you know, it's impossible to answer as long as a piece of string. Van Gogh could knock off a painting in an hour. Someone else might take six months, a year. However, this one, I think, takes the record because it took 12 years to paint. Um, First of all, Angra got the subject, her rather unusual pose, her position with her, her head leaning against her hand and her, her finger against her temple, which interestingly enough, he copied from an ancient Roman fresco of the goddess um, Arcadia from Herculaneum. It's a fresco that he'd seen in the archeological museum in Naples. So that he got off quite quickly. He then came back, did numerous sittings, numerous um, 
preparatory sketches, studies, drawings. And originally, um, Madame Mortessi had recently had a little daughter, Catherine. And the idea was that Catherine, who was about one or two at the time, would be in the portrait, sort of leaning her head on her mother's lap in a rather sort of touching uh, gesture. However, then there was a big uh, pause because Angle's beloved first wife died and he was so grief stricken that he was un virtually unable to work at all for about uh, two years. So that there was a big uh, pause then. Uh, then he went on with more and more preparatory studies. By 1851, which is seven years after he'd started working on it, Monsieur Moitessier by this stage was very angry. So to pacify him, Anger did another portrait of Madame Moitessier, which he did in eight months. So he was quite capable of doing a portrait quickly, in which she's standing full length, wearing a black dress with a wreath of flowers in her hair. And you can see that very beautiful portrait today in the National Gallery in Washington. But he now returned to our Madame Mortessier, but by this time, Catherine, the daughter, was much too grown up and big to be in the picture, so she had to be edited out. And in 1855, at the last minute, Anger undertook another dramatic change, because until then, Madame Mortessier had been wearing a dress of pure yellow silk, plain yellow. However, in that year, 1855, a major world's fair was held in Paris, and one of the outstanding displays was a display by the silk manufacturers of Lyon. And Lyon silk was renowned for its bold floral designs. And all of the fashionable ladies, including the Empress, wanted to wear these dresses in this wonderful flower patterned silk from Lyon. And so uh, Ang repainted Madame. Martessier's dress completely in this magnificent fabric. Uh, before we leave this painting, just look at the subtlety of the way he's captured the back of her head and her profile in the mirror behind. And we just get sort of glimpses of this very um, opulent room, the pink damask uh, silk on the sofa on which she's seated. We can see this part of a Japanese uh, vase and also I, I think it's probably a Persian fan in the background, all things designed to show um, Madame Watessier's wealth um, and her taste. But she sits there, I always think, oh, so sort of still like a great kind of goddess of um, ancient Rome, but of Paris in the Second Empire, a kind of distillation of a, a particular era. Uh, next slide, please. So now we go to something completely different. We now still in France in the 19th century, but we've moved now to 1869-70 and the birth of Impressionism. And I think you can see an extraordinary radical uh, jump, at least from Angra's sort of style of painting, which is you absolutely flawless. You hardly can hardly see the brush marks to here where they're extremely visible. Um, this is Monet, Claude Monet, who, as you know, was really became the leader of the Impressionist movement. But at the beginning of his career, painting a popular bathing spot on the River Seine, where Parisians would go perhaps on a Sunday afternoon to picnic, to sit by the river. And as you can see from the ladies in their black uh, bathing suits of the day, where the, the sort of like short uh, pants uh, come down to sort of knee length, um, came eat to, to swim as well. And you can see little bobbing heads of people swimming in, in the water beyond the jetty that sticks out. Um, this was a place called La Grenouillère, which literally means the frog pond. It was also a little circular island in the middle of the Seine, and it was sometimes affectionately known as the Camembert, because it was round like a Camembert cheese. It was a very popular um, recreational spot. And Renoir, the, another leading Impressionist, and Monet, uh, painted this sitting side by side. So there are two very similar works. The Monet's one is here in London in the National Gallery and Renoir's is in the National Gallery in Stockholm in Sweden. Um, 
actually this was not intended as a finished painting originally it was a, a rather finished sketch or study for a bigger work that Monet intended to paint and submit to the annual salon in 1870 but he never painted that picture um, I think what's so interesting about this is he, he's not interested in realistic detail at all. You can just see that the figures, that the swimmers that I mentioned, the two women to the left, one of the, with a red uh, skirt, he's just kind of sketched them in quickly with just two or three dabs of paint. He's outlined the boats in the foreground with just a few bold touches of the brush. He's not interested in any kind of photographic or documentary realism. What he's interested in is conveying with the greatest immediacy possible the sort of feelings and the impressions uh, that this scene arouses in him. This scene of a, a scene on a sunny afternoon uh, with the light filtering through the trees and sparkling on the water. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I show you this close up of the water here. Monet loved painting water because he, what he's really interested in is capturing light. And of course, water reflects light. But I think this is very interesting to look at this detail and see the Monet's technique, because uh, this work was painted completely out of doors. In the past, of course, the artists had always done sketches out of doors, but in the main, they would then finish works back in their studios. What was revolutionary about Impressionism in its early years was that artists painted entirely out of doors, rather quickly to capture this spontaneity and fleeting effects of light. And two technical inventions made this possible. Most importantly, the invention of the little, um, the metal squeezy tube, you know, like we have our toothpaste in today, because it meant that paints could be portable. Before that, you'd have to have kind of liquid paint in a big bladder. Now an artist could go out with a bag full of all kinds of colors in little squeezy tubes. And then there also little, uh, little um, containers were made for carrying paintbrushes, but this meant that the paintbrushes had to have flatter, uh, be flatter brushes rather than rounded ones. So you get uh, an artist like Monet painting in these sort of dabs of paint, almost like little tiles in a, a mosaic, and that becomes very much a hallmark of um, the Impressionist style, these dobs sort of dabs, dabs of paint. Um, and this is one reason why, um, as they developed, you know, they first showed publicly in a few years later in 1874, why they attracted such incomprehension and hostile criticism for the public who admired the technique of an artist like Ingres. So to them, to their eyes, Monet was just a sort of incompetent dauber who didn't know his technique. Uh, next slide, please. So, but just looking again at the whole picture, we can see that it really works, that he varies his texture throughout the composition, he varies the size of the brush stroke, and the whole thing ends up as a kind of sparkling hole. Next slide. Uh, now here we're looking at a very similar kind of subject, painted a bit later, 1884, about 14 years later, by a young and again very innovative uh, Paris-based artist called Georges Seurat. Uh, the title is Bathers at Agnières. Uh, Agnières is again uh, a sort of a, a leisure spot along the River Seine. Again, it's probably a Sunday afternoon. We've got sort of office workers and factory workers perhaps on their day off, uh, standing in the water, swimming, just resting on the banks on a sunny day. Um, Anier was a kind of industrial suburb, and you can see in the distance the smoke from the gas works that were at, at Anier and also the factories that were springing up there. So it's a similar subject of, you know, working class leisure in a way, but it very, very different in feel from the Monet that we've just been looking at, because whereas that was all about sparkle and movement, 
this is about sparkling light, but there's an extraordinary uncanny stillness about the whole thing. The, the, the figures look as if they are, are sculptures carved in stone. They're so monumental and so still, um, which reminds us that Surat did had had a, a traditional training for a brief while at the École des Beaux-Arts in Paris. He also spent a lot of time in the Louvre and looking at the antique um, marble friezes of classical antiquity, Greek and Roman antiquity, where you get figures in profile like this with this great kind of uh, sense of monumentality. Uh, so just, you know, a man like climbing with his dog behind him takes on this kind of weight and the still life of the, of the bather who's seated in his uh, orangey pink uh, shorts with his shirt behind him, his straw hat, his boots, beautifully composed little still life. And look how um, Siraz caught the shadows of all of these objects. And, uh, and his mastery of the sparkle of light over the water is beautiful. And I particularly love the reflections of the white sail, the little sailboat off to the right, just how beautifully the, that reflection of the sail is caught in the water below. Um, he was working uh, in a new style, this is the beginning of a new style called pointism or pointism in English, which when he began to work in very small dabs of paint. Um, let's see, next slide please. I'll uh, show you a, a close-up. You can see in the close-up on the right how he's done the grass and the water in, in, in very, not at all like Monet's sort of clumpy um, patches. Uh, next slide, we can compare the two directly. You see, no, no, one back. No, back. That's it. Um, you can compare Mo Monet's brushwork with uh, Surat's. And uh, Surat developed uh, this uh, technique even further. Next slide, please. Um, not in this painting, although he's nearly there, but a, a very famous painting done just two years later, which I expect some of you might be familiar with, called Sunday Afternoon at La Grande Jatte, another of these kind of recreational spots along the Seine, a huge painting in the Art Institute of Chicago, which is entirely made up of little tiny pinpoints of pe paint. This is kind of transitional Sierra's moving toward that style. Um, just before we leave this painting, I think my absolute favorite um, element in this painting is the, the little boy on the right in his red hat, holding his, cupping his hands to his mouth and he's calling out because this painting is so much about stillness, utter stillness and silence that to have this sense of sound, his voice calling is really kind of strange and uncanny and very, very beautiful and evocative, I think. Uh, Sura was really one of the most original painters at the end of the 19th century, but very sadly, he died very young, only six years after painting this. He, he died in um, 1891, uh, 80, yes, uh, he was eight, at the age of 31. Not quite clear what he died of. It was either, I think, meningitis or diphtheria. But anyway, it was an, this was an extraordinary and beautiful and compelling painting that really does um, kind of dominate this 19th century gallery at the National Gallery. Um, let's go now to the next slide. Uh, Van Gogh. Well, you would immediately know this was uh, Vincent Van Gogh, even if I if we didn't if I didn't mention his name at all. He is such a distinctive artist, and I think probably uh, most of us, when we think of him immediately think of sunflowers as the subject that we always associate with him. He signed this rather proudly Vincent. He always signed himself just Vincent and not Vincent van Gogh because he thought people found his last name, his Dutch, Dutch name, too difficult to pronounce. And of course, the, the Dutch say it in a very guttural way, van Gogh. In England, we say Van Gogh, and in America, we say Van Gogh. So perhaps he had a point about always just calling himself Vincent. Um, one thing that really strikes you walking into this 
this particular room or rooms at the National Gallery where we come across Impressionism and post-Impressionism. That's the art of Van Gogh, Gauguin, artists that come after Impressionism, is the colour is suddenly really zingy. It's, it's a different kind of order and intensity and electricity about the colour. Not that old master paintings aren't wonderfully sumptuous and rich and colourful, they are, of course, but there's a new kind of vibrancy and directness. And it is, again, because of these paints I was just mentioning, the paints that come in tubes and that were chemically produced, so that it gives uh, artists a whole new range of colour, a new way of working. Um, Van Gogh himself said that this is a painting that was entirely about yellow, which was his favourite colour, because he felt that yellow was about the force of life. Um, Van Gogh had been born in Newnan in Holland, and really the first 30 years of his life, pretty much, or until he was um, in his late twenties, pretty much a failure. He tried all various careers of being an evangelical preacher, being a teacher, working for a while uh, for an art dealership, all without success. And he didn't really did not hit on the idea of becoming an artist until he was 27. And he had an astonishingly short career because he died just 10 years later in, at the age of 37. But what he produced in that 10 years once he found his path was phenomenal. Uh, he left Holland and moved to Paris in 1886. And then in 1888, he was sort of burned out by Parisian life and he wanted to go to the south. He came from the north of Europe in Holland and he, want, he was attracted, as many artists have been, to the brilliant light of the south of France. So yellow for him captured the idea of Provence and the south, as indeed did the sunflowers. Um, here, in he, he did seven uh, versions of the sunflowers in a vase. Uh, he painted four in 1888, which is when the National Gallery's one was painted. And then he did three replicas, you know, copies, but copies that he did himself the following year in 1889. Um, arguably, this is the best of the first group of the 1888 group. Um, there are 15 sunflowers in this vase, but they're not all um, in the first bloom. If you, if you look closely, you can see some of them are actually sort of brownish rather than yellow, and some of them are dead, but they are filled with the little seed heads, the little seeds that will produce in the fullness of time in the next year, a new crop of sunflowers. So although it's a very joyful subject in a way, there is this undercurrent of melancholy and the idea of the transience of life, which is something that Van Gogh deals with a lot in his art, a theme that um, he's very aware of. He gives kind of tremendous definition by that blue line and in, in between the different yellows, the very pale yellow of the background, more sort of richer yellow, of yellowy color of the table, and then the different hues of yellows and ochreish, brownish yellows in the flowers themselves. Uh, Van Gogh painted all of these sunflowers with a particular purpose in mind. When he moved down from Paris to Arles in Provence in the south of France, he was hoping very much to encourage his friend Paul Gauguin to come and join him. He enormously admired Gauguin and he had this sort of vision of setting up in the south of France a, a kind of commune of artists working together. Uh, he loved Japanese art, the, the, the art of the Japanese woodblock printmakers of the 18th century, artists such as Hiroshiga. And, and he, he'd read somewhere that this was how the Japanese artists operated and that he, he wanted to create this. Also, Van Gogh was a very lonely person and he, he found it very difficult. He had a difficult personality. He had psychological problems. And so I think it, a way of, you know, he wanted to kind of have a kind of human group around him. Gauguin was reluctant to come. Gauguin was up in the north of France in Brittany, he kept writing and putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. Eventually he came. Van Gogh had rented a house in a, a little yellow house, as it happened in Arles, called the Yellow House. And the room that was to be Gauguin, he filled 
with these paintings of sunflowers. Gauguin arrived, they worked together for, for about three months, but it was a very turbulent, uh, competitive relationship. And at the end of the year, on the 23rd of December of 1888, Van Gogh had his first major breakdown and apparently attacked or went, or went to attack uh, Gauguin with a razor. Gauguin fled, went back to Paris. The famous story, as you all know, I'm sure Van Gogh cut off part of his ear and took it and gave it to a prostitute in a nearby brothel. And then he was hospitalized. Um, and eventually, later the next year, moved to the asylum at Saint Remy. Um, so there's a great deal of story behind behind these sunflowers. A very, very kind of poignant um, story in a way. Um, but they do remain extraordinarily beautiful and and uh, compelling paintings. Uh, next slide, please. So now so it is my last uh, work. Um, Degas, one of my favorite artists, is the one I, I wrote my uh, thesis on. Um, this is a late work by Degas. Degas, as you know, also a leading figure in the Impressionist movement. But this is much later, this is 1896. And, and by then, his style and his whole approach to art has really moved quite a long way from the original ideas about Impressionism. You know, this is not a kind of painting about outdoor light or spontaneity. Um, uh, Dugar painted many works throughout his life, both in pastel oil drawings. He's an artist who worked in many different techniques of women in interiors and particularly women either grooming themselves, bathing or being groomed as this is the case here of a woman having her hair brushed by a maidservant. Degas loved to capture these kind of private offbeat moments. You know, he's renowned as you all know, I'm sure as the, as the great dancer, uh, artist of the dance, painting ballet. Uh, but very often it, rather than the dancers on the stage, it's when they're waiting in the wings or a rehearsing or in the dance class that interests him more than the performance. And here's very much a sort of private uh, moment. Uh, he concentrates, he was a wonderful draftsman, uh, Degas. Here we can very clearly see the under drawing, though it's probably done in, in charcoal, possibly uh, paint, but he captures the outlines, you know, the outlines of the woman's body, her arm, the arm reaching back in this very um, kind of flowing line. But for me, the most remarkable thing about this painting is the color. It's really an extraordinary called a symphony in reds and oranges. It, it's a very limited color range, but a very rich one. And it's very daring, I think, to have a woman in a red dress with red hair against a red wall and a red curtain draped in the background. The maid also has red hair and she's in a pink blouse, all within this hot, fiery range of color. So it makes it very kind of modern. It almost verges on the concept of abstract painting, really. This painting is, a, is much about line, form, and just color for its own sake, as it is about the individuals. You notice that he does, he paints the women's two faces in a very schematic way. You know, we don't really learn very much about the details of their appearance or their character. You know, they, they are kind of almost abstract forms in this overall abstract composition. It's quite sketchily painted and he gets this marvelous sort of sense of texture, which I think we can see what an experienced artist he was in pastel and how much of that pastel he brings into his work in oil. The painting is, however, unfinished. Um, Degas was unable to work really pretty much for about the last 10 years of his life. He didn't die till 1917, but he was increasingly blind during that period. So the 1890s up to 1900 is his last fully active decade. Um, after his death in um, 1917, a huge number of unfinished works were found in his studio, both finished and unfinished and was sold at three big auctions in Paris in 1918. And at um, one of the um, um, bidders at that auction who 
bought this painting was none, none other than Henri Matisse, uh, which I think is very interesting because Matisse, as we know, is a wonderful colorist of the 20th century, early 20th century. And it's not surprising that he fell in love with and wanted to own this really very radical painting by an artist of, an earlier, of the earlier generation, uh, Edouard Degas. Well, that brings me to the end of my virtual tour. Um, the National Gallery is full of wonderful masterpieces, but um, I think uh, we've received enough of those. And I'd, yeah, like to, I'd like to thank, thank you, so, you much so much for, 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 for I think I'm the reason we're having, having Jim, could you turn off your, Jim and I are both Jim watching are you both in the same room. You're getting an echo. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm going to go to another room. <laughs> So, Anne, I just want to thank you so very much for sharing your highlights uh, from the National Gallery. We're, Columbus is so fortunate to have you um, as a part of our museum family and uh, as a curator. So what we'd like to do now is uh, we're going to ask everybody to type their questions in the chat. But while you're doing that, I want to talk to you about two trips that Anne is planning um, as director's trips for the Columbus Museum of Art. And if you, I noticed a number of you in the audience um, have taken these trips with us. And I want to tell you about these next two trips. The first is going to be in November, uh, early November, I think, first half of November. And uh, Anne has a show, um, Anne has a show in, uh, in Houston where she is also a curator. It's called a uh, Calder Picasso. And that would be the reason we're going, but there's much more to do in Houston. And Anne, could you tell us um, what else you were thinking we might do on this trip? Yeah, uh, the Calder Picasso uh, exhibition is a really interesting show. It, it originated at the Musée Picasso in Paris uh, about 18 months ago. And these, of course, you know, two great innovative artists of the 20th century but very different. And they didn't actually know it, you know, their paths, they did meet, but not very much. Um, but there's all sorts of fascinating correspondences that emerge, particularly in the way that they deal with uh, emptiness and space. I think you can see here, you know, one of Calder's early, incredibly radical wire sculptures where he just encircles space with a piece of wire. And then you see it in the contour um, of Picasso's great painting of his, his mistress, his girlfriend at the time, Marie-Thérèse Voltaire. So, um, so that's the exhibition that we can certainly look at. And then just recently in, in Houston, just in October, this magnificent new building opened, the Kinder Building, uh, in which it housed the museum's collection of uh, 20th century and uh, contemporary art. It's a, it's a beautiful building by the architect Stephen Hull. The collections are wonderfully installed. We could also, of course, look at the permanent collection in the, um, the Beck building, which is more my area, you know, French uh, 19th century uh, earlier painting. And then, of course, there's the wonderful Menil uh, collection, uh, which we will visit, and uh, which has the famous Rothko uh, Chapel. And so, you know, there's really a, a lot to see in terms of, of art, I think, at the highest level. And then our next trip, Patricia, we, can we have the next slide? Yes. Okay. <laughs> this is the trip we were going to do this April. And um, <laughs> the Art of Provence and the French Riviera with Anne Dumas. And we will be focusing on many of the artists that Anne talked to, well, some of the artists that Anne talked about, um, including um, Van Gogh, Matisse, Cezanne, Picasso, and Renoir. And we will be visiting some of their studios, some of their homes, and some museums devoted to their work. Um, the trip will start in Aix-en-Provence and go on to Nice. It would be 10 days, as you can see. And uh, Anne and I are re-putting the trip together. We had done it once and, um, and now we're 
we're putting together again. Andy, do you have anything else you want to say about this trip? Otherwise, we'll go into questions. Uh, just very briefly, we're going to base it on two centers. We're starting in Aix, beautiful town of Aix-en-Provence, uh, where really Cézanne is the focus. We will drive around the countryside, you know, and see the Mont Saint-Victoire, which he painted so many times. His studio is still intact and pretty much untouched since the day he died. We can visit that. Um, Aix itself is a beautiful town. Uh, we'll be going to the Picasso Museum in Antibes. We'll be going to Renoir's uh, house and studio. Uh, there's the new Bonnard Museum at, at Le Canet. And then after X, we will be basing ourselves in Nice, uh, where Matisse will be really a focus. We visit, we will have a private tour of the Musée Matisse, and we will visit the famous uh, chapel at Advance, which you see the slide of here. So I think that'd be a really very um, rich, rewarding and, and very fun trip. Thank you, Anne. Well, I do have one question uh, from Sue Oakes. And she says, do you think that Surratt may be giving a nod and a wink to in his bathers painting to the classical theme of the young merman Triton, usually shown blowing a horn? Oh, that's a marvelous idea. Yes, I, I'd never heard that before, but uh, it is so striking that the boy with the, the cut hands, you know, introducing this sound. And as I mentioned, I think that Sura was looking at uh, classical art and classical friezes where he may well have seen that subject. So it's a great, great, great uh, question. I can't answer it precisely, but I like the idea very much. <laughs> And uh, so we're hoping so that we'll get some more questions. But in the meantime, um, everybody is saying how fantastic uh, the talk was. And I just want to let you know. There was lots of activity in the chat. It's mostly great congratulations. But um, <laughs> so it's good. So uh... Nana, you had a question earlier. Oh, well, actually, I was I was gonna uh, because Anne's been with us so long. I was gonna ask. It wasn't really about the presentation, but ask her what her favorite project at the museum so far has been. <laughs> um, well, I, we did a, the first exhibition. You remember that we did was Renoir's Women, mm -hmm. because we thought we, <laughs> we we thought we should kick off with something really popular, and it was popular. And it was a good show, but the second one we did uh, was, I, I think we was, it was a little bit more esoteric perhaps, but I, it was also, I think, popular, wasn't it, Nanette? Was the one on Dugar's landscapes. Yes, and it was. I mean, um, uh, the thing I always remember uh, about, that, about that show was that Philippe de Montebello came to visit, who was still then the director at the Metropolitan in New York, who came in during that and he, um, I was showing him the exhibition um, and he um, he said, well, and I'm showing it because the Met had lent their Degas landscape. And, I, and he turned to me and he said, do you remember the game? Do you play the game? And I said, the game? And he said, you know, when you go to another museum, what would be the one picture that you would want to take back to your museum? <laughs> and I said, oh, yes, I know that game. And he said, and he's standing in front of our Degas landscape. And he says, this is the one for me. And I said, but yours is here. And he said, I know, but I like yours better. So <laughs> I never well, it was interesting, that show, because, you know, Degas, I mentioned earlier, everyone thinks of him as the painter of ballet dancers, which he is. But he, towards the end, actually, pretty much around the time when we he painted that picture we were just looking at the National Gallery, he does get interested in landscape. And Columbus happens to have the best one of his landscapes, the saint Valery on, on yeah, It is quite- um, uh, out, So we were able to bring together some of the others. We brought all those beautiful pastels and monotypes together. So mm -hmm. it was a really good show. Mm. Well, I think um, we should let people go. And on, honestly, usually I'm very strict, you know, when we're in the auditorium, I'm always like, like by a few minutes before the hour, I start drifting. If some of you have been in the auditorium with me, I drift down toward the front to indicate that we must close out. 
I let us go long because how often do we get Anne from London and you're all on Zoom, so you, it's not like you have to get up in the middle of the auditorium and leave. No. <laughs> and a remarkable number of you stayed until just two minutes ago, we were still well over 100. So I thank you, Anne, for doing this for us. Armchair travel, I can't wait till we can travel. I know Nancy cannot wait till we can travel together again in person. But to be able to gather and, and have an armchair experience, I think it was wonderful. I know I learned lots of things today about those pictures. Uh, really, I did. So thank you all for joining us. We're going to try to do another one of these, maybe with Anne, but also we have a couple of other. I'm trying to get our friends in Dresden uh, to do one with us. So we are working on this. So thank you all. Thank you for supporting the museum. And um, we love you all. Take care. Nanette, there uh -huh. are a couple more questions. Oh, there are. Okay, then do a couple more because people can always peel off and we still have 80 people. So a okay. few more questions. Sue asked again, um, Anne, if you'd like to speculate further, might Aang be alluding to the Mona Lisa's famous expression with the way in which he paints Madame Mo I I'm going to mess okay. up the name. Yes, <laughs> almost smile. Yes, yes, I, that, very good. I, I, I um, it's, it's entirely possible. I, I had no one I think has precisely mentioned that, but you know, Angle was steeped in the art of the past. The artist he most admired from the past is Raphael. And, and if you think of her pose, and I, I think the whole idea, his original idea of including the little daughter while she was still little, uh, in the painting was, you know, there are, uh, we think of some of those Madonna and child to Raphael, whether as a child or, you, I think it's that kind of idea in his mind. And as I said, the actual pose was based on, we know from his notebooks and sketches, is based on a, a Roman fresco. But, you know, he was all the time in the Louvre. The Mona Lisa was in the Louvre at that time in the 19th century. He would certainly have been very familiar with that painting. So I think that's entirely possible because she does have a rather enigmatic expression. Thank you, Anne. And I think this might be more of a question for Nancy, but Constance asked, will we be organizing a trip to Indianapolis to view the interactive um, Vincent's exhibit? Well, that sounds very interesting. I didn't know about it. And uh, I'd love to hear ideas from all of you and I will present that to the committee. I know we had a trip to uh, Indianapolis planned right before um, the shutdown. So sure, that sounds like a great idea. Mm. And I believe that is it. And like Nanette was saying, there's a lot of praise. People love this Zoom. So I'm glad everyone was here with us. Right. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.